And here, there's nothing to keep them in check. There's no control on their population because they no longer have natural predators or parasites or diseases and so on. So in that sense, they could be bad. But the reality is that most insects are good or neutral. It's only about 5% that fall into that pest category. Can I ask you dumb questions while I'm eating? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Always come my students, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Right. You don't know the answer, come on, guys. You said female mosquitoes? Yes. Okay, so male mosquitoes don't bite us? No. Just the females. Oh, <coughs> keep going. Yes. I did not know that. No, I did not. I can tell you the difference between a male and a female crawfish, but. I can't check it. I bet you can. <laughs> but so, not everybody can. Let's, let's deal with this first 95% that we consider to be good or at least neutral, or often you'll hear the word beneficial insects. And the reason that they're good is because they're food for many other organisms, including people in many parts of the world. Insects are high in protein. Um, a lot of them act as decomposers, predators, parasitoids, or pollinators are the, the beneficials we usually think of. So let's deal first with the decomposers. And usually we kind of think of, ooh, yuck, because they're living in dead bodies or waste or, you know, we feel they're kind of nasty. But a better word for them might be recyclers. Because without the decomposers in the world, we probably still have dead dinosaurs lying around. So they're helping to break down that organic matter, recycle the nutrients, help our plants grow. Uh, so some of the insects that fall into this category include cockroaches, grubs, which are beetle larvae, and flies. Are cockroaches beneficial? They are beneficial in the sense that they're decomposers. Mm. Wow. Now predators um, kill and eat other animals. So here you can see the larva of a ladybug <coughs> or lady beetle. And I included this photo because y'all know what ladybugs look like, but a lot of people don't know that those are the larvae and they end up killing them, not realizing that they're killing a very beneficial insect. But ladybugs eat a lot of aphids, don't they? Yes, lots of insects. And then you can see a cicada wasp. Luckily, it was on the other side of the window from my hand, <laughs> but they're huge. And as the name implies, they eat cicadas. And then this is an assassin bug. Um, technically, it's called a North American wheel bug. Yeah. And I found this in my garden. And um, they, like their name implies, uh, do kill and eat other insects. Yeah, they inject some kind of toxin that destroys all the organs in the other bug, and then they sip it all out of it. Yeah, uh, they are, um, they are. They're pretty uh, unaggressive. But you do not want to get bitten by one of these. It's like an electric shock and it hurts mm -hmm. for two weeks. Oh, so these are ones to admire from afar. <laughs> Is that the same thing as a stink bug? No. No. It looks like a stink bug. It sure does. And that's what many people confuse. Yeah. They confuse them with leaf footed bugs, which look a lot like this, but they're very different. Um, so these would be the good guys. So that little guy was in your garden. You took that picture? Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, I just had a lot of like a ballot. I wouldn't have been able to take them. Yeah, they're pretty big. They're probably a couple inches long. And um, they, um, the one I saw was a female. She's actually laying eggs there. You can see them right there. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember. That was in the fall sometime. And then that spring, I saw her babies. Running around the garden, the nymphs. So, those are just some examples of predators that you might have in your own yard who are really doing a service and helping to take, take care of some of the. Was there not a number of plants? No. And one way, if you're wondering, if you see something that looks like this and you're wondering, hmm, is that a, a like a predator, predatory bug or is that something that's eating my plants? Usually, if it's a predator, you'll see one because they don't hang out in, in groups. But if you see a bunch of them, it's probably eating your plants. Yeah. I have one question. Uh, yeah. Um, 
you know, a lot of bees are the pollinators, but do wasps pollinate? Yeah, there's okay. a lot of pollinators. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is a wasp that is a parasitoid. This is a draconid wasp, and they parasitize, um, in this case, a tomato hornworm caterpillar. Oh, yes. Yeah. White pigs are the, um, the larvae, and you're going to eat that caterpillar. So if you see one like that, of course we all want to get rid of tomato hornworms, but if you see one like that, let it live for a while because then the wasps will have a chance to hatch out. It's, it's going to die. But. So wait, that's a caterpillar mm -hmm. with wasp larvae or... Yeah. They also, oh. there's, one, there's one wasp that injects the eggs inside the caterpillar. Right. Yeah. So a lot of the uh, the various types of wasps, Braconid wasps, uh, like this one, um, Ichneumonids, and there's one that's called the Velvet Ant. It's really a wasp. So they're all uh, parasitoids. I'm, I'm, I'm glad the wasps in this room are okay then. Yeah. And then of course pollinators have the job of carrying pollen grains from the female part of the plant to the, mm -hmm. the male, or the other way around, the male part to the female part of the plant. And we usually think of bees um, or butterflies, but there's a number of insects that are pollinators, including <clears throat> beetles, flies, wasps, wow. um, and several others. So um, I had no idea that beetles were. Yeah. My, my nana used to kill Japanese beetles because they said it would kill the roses. Well, those are not pollinators. <laughs> okay, all right. So you might want to know, well, how can you attract more pollinators to your garden? And there's several things to keep in mind. One thing is you want to provide food for the different stages of life. So for the larvae or caterpillars, um, you would <coughs> have whatever they eat. And it can be specific, like the monarchs eat milkweed. Um, There's some that will live on passion flower vines and so on. Um, and often they're pretty specific about what they'll eat. So you have to have that food in your yard. And then you also want food for adults, which is nectar, so you'd want a lot of different flowers throughout the year. Um, when we were out in the um, in our garden harvesting, there was um, some kind of, I think, a Chinese mustard that was blooming. Do you remember that? Yeah. And it yeah. was, yeah, it, it was no longer producing the leaves that we wanted, but we left it there because it was covered in bees. Oh, it was covered. And there was nothing yeah. else in January. So um, leave the food, they need water, um, shelter of some sort, and then IPM, Integrated Pest Management, we're gonna talk about in just a bit. But all those things are essential for having pollinators in your garden. So let's turn to the so-called bad or pest insects. Um, technically, a pest is any unwanted insect or animal that interferes with human activity. Um, and I have put them into four categories, um, just for convenience sake. Um, there's probably others, but we're going to take a little time to talk about the sap suckers and chewing insects, because they can be real problems for our plants. Uh, the wood destroying insects, and then those that we consider to be household pests. So the sap suckers um, are a big group. Aphids fall into that category scale. You can see them up in the top picture, the little green guys. Oh, okay. Sometimes they're red, too. Yeah, they're white, brown, yeah. different types. Um, scale insect is in the bottom picture. Those are our crepe myrtles right up in front of the sanctuary. Um, white flies, mealybugs. There's a white thing <laughs> in the bottom? Uh, the white cloth? Yeah. Or, okay. yeah. Um, so all of these sap suckers have uh, piercing and sucking mouth parts, kind of like a hypodermic needle almost, and they jab it into the leaf or the stem, and then they suck out the sap, the phloem uh, fluid. Um, so again, you'll often see large numbers of them. Uh, aphids actually go through what's called parthenogenesis, where the moms have daughters, and the daughters have the granddaughters, and there's no males, so generation after generation after generation. And then in the fall, as it gets colder, they'll produce a few males and mate and have um, eggs that overwinter. So they can produce three generations without mate. Or more. Oh, wow. 
And that way the population can get really, really high quickly. And they can just take over your plant almost. A um, couple of problems that you'll see, um, they may stunt the shoots. They often are, as you can see, up right on the tips of the plants. So they can damage the tips. Um, that might be the, your buds, your flower buds. Um, and then the other problem is that as they're feeding on all this sugary sap, they're busy pooping sugary waste called honeydew. It just kind of goes right through them. And you'll notice that the leaves on the plant might be sticky or shiny from all this sugary waste. And often mold grows on the waste. And that's all the black stuff you see on the leaves and the stem of the great myrtles. Are they damaging to uh, <coughs> sago plants? They could be. Okay. Um, I see them in a sago sometimes. I'm like, yeah. yeah. This particular one in the bottom is um, crepe myrtle scale, which is new to our area and is becoming a big problem. Yeah. But um, you don't necessarily have to do anything about them because the crepe myrtles are going to survive. Um, they often will be attracted to plants that are kind of stressed. So, you know, how hot and dry it was during the summer, oh. our crepe myrtles were stressed, and, and there they are. Um, so, the way you deal with them is you can wash your tree. You can get a brush and soapy water and wash off all the nasty black mold and the scale insects along with it. Um, if it's not too big, you can do that. Um, I think Jerry did use a pesticide um, of some sort, but. What kind of soap do you use? Do you mind me asking? Sorry to interrupt. Um, often Dawn is, because you're, what you're really doing with the soap is you're uh, penetrating the exoskeleton. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sometimes you'll see ants crawling on the plant as well because the plants basically farm these sap sucking insects. They eat the honeydew. So. <clears throat> the ants probably really aren't harming your plant at all. And then the chewing insects. Uh, so there's your Japanese beetle, various kinds of caterpillars, larvae, um, like beetle larvae or grubs, grasshoppers, leaf cutter ants, you name it, they're out there chewing on your plants. And um, so mostly they're going to go for the young leaves, the tasty young leaves. Um, and they can do quite a bit of damage. Yeah, I've seen the, the green one you have on the right on my cabbage a lot. Yes, those are real problems oh, yeah. for brassicas, cabbage, you, broccoli. How do you get them? Hmm? Where do they come from? They're, um, the adults are white moths. White moths? Mm -hmm. You'll see the white moths fluttering all over uh -huh. your garden, and pretty soon you'll see tiny little green worms. Okay. Those are the caterpillars. Wow. And grasshoppers do you eat? Too. Oh yeah, grasshoppers will eat everything. Mm -hmm. All right, another big category of, of pests are the wood destroying um, beetles or termites. And um, the, the standard, the one that we often see is the native subterranean termite. And as you know, they can destroy your house. But we have in recent years, um, been invaded by Formosan subterranean termites, which are from the Pacific Rim. And they are particularly bad because they um, can be quite aggressive. They breed um, more readily, more quickly than the regular termites. So they can get huge populations. Like you might have two million of them sitting there. And um, <coughs> because of that, they can do a lot of damage very quickly. And then the beetle larvae um, are also often um, wood destroying insects. Um, and they do tend to be attracted to stress, damage, dying, or dead plants. Um, they're what we call secondary invaders because the plant already is suffering from maybe heat and, and drought like we had this summer. And then they move in. So um, this particular one is the southern pine bark beetle, and um, this is the adult, 
but the ones that are really doing the damage are the larvae. And they're boring into the wood right under the bark. This particular kind has kind of S-shaped galleries. Um, others, you can tell because of the, it's a D-shaped hole, and you know, there's all sorts of ways that you can identify exactly what's um, damaging your trees. But they will kill them very quickly. And you want to get that tree out and destroyed, um, or they'll spread to your other pines. Longhorn beetles and graver beetles, there's a whole host of these uh, wood destroying beetles. Will they do wood damage to the wood in the house? No. Okay. And then we do have various household pests. I guess you'd lump termites in that category as well. Um, ants. Cockroaches, we consider to be pests when they're trekking through our house and our food. Uh, flies, wasps, mosquitoes, bed bugs, even bees can be a problem if they're nesting in uh, your porch or someplace where they can sting people. So those are just examples of animals that we consider to be pests. A neighbor chef got his baby last spring of bees and um, they act as a briefing, which we had but it, their whole outside shed mm -hmm. was in there and they had to get the beekeeper to come out and get the bees out, but she's an elementary teacher. She used it as a teaching moment and they got the honey and she and the kids, they did the honey mm -hmm. and you still have a drawer sitting there that they bought us. And it, that was interesting, but I'm glad it was in the shed in my mom. Well, and part of the problem is if and they're in your house and they're dying and there's honey sitting in there, then you're going to have other pests like the cockroaches coming in. Mm -hmm. So um, the main thing with uh, these kinds of household pests is they're coming in for food, water, or what they call harborage. I mean, we're creating these warm houses with food and water, and of course they're going to come what in. What about the silver fish, huh? Where did come they, they're a type of insect that you'll often find down among the baseboards yeah. and so on, and they don't hurt anything. Yeah. Um, I was uh, looking at one study, I think it was in North Carolina, where they um, tried to count the number of species of insects in a person's house. Mm -hmm. And it was around 100 different kinds yeah. of, of insects, mm -hmm. and somewhere as high as a couple hundred. But most of them, again, 95% are just sitting there doing very little, no, it's not hurting you at all. I lost the ones that don't mind. The mud daubers, yeah. Or so they, they are considered a loss? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. They keep building their homes outside mm -hmm. the front, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. front porch and back yeah. porch. Yeah. Isn't it? But they don't sting or anything, do they? Well, they might. Yes, they might. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They go with the yeah. mud dauber down. Yeah. So the question then is well, how can we manage pests? And, um, I constantly get emails from people to ask a master gardener online saying, something's chewing my plants, how do I kill them? That's always the question, how do I kill them? You don't necessarily have to kill everything. <laughs> so there's uh, something called IPM, and that stands for Integrated Pest Management. And it's been around for quite a while. Um, can't think, what was it called? Oh yeah, integrated control in the 1950s. So it's not something that's new. It's been around for a long time. Um, back in 1972, the Texas AgriLife Extension Pest Management agents started working with cotton producers in the state using IPM. So it's definitely tried and true, but it's, it's an approach that's basically common sense. It's the idea that you don't necessarily have to reach for the pesticide. There are many other ways to manage pests. You don't have to have a chainsaw to cut butter. Um, the, the goal is really to reduce the pest population to you know a low enough level so you're still getting your veggies and your flowers and your crop or whatever. Um, and it helps to maintain a healthy environment overall. So, let me get in the right spot here, I can't see. There it is. Um, it's called integrated pest management because you're using a number of different methods to try to control pests. And if you do need to use some sort of 
pesticide, you're trying to use the least toxic that will do the job. So overall, we're trying to uh, minimize risks, especially to younger people, pets and so on. And it's practical, it works. That's the, the real key is that it, it works. So first of all, what you need to figure out is what is the problem? Like, look at that tomato. What would you assume? I was wondering what it was. It's <laughs> <laughs> like a stem, right? Oh, not a lot. No, that's the bottom of a tomato, and you can mm -hmm. see that weird brown stuff right around it. So, yeah, nothing. That's not good. <laughs> that mold? No. I don't know. No, no. Fungus, no bacteria, no virus, no right. insects, no. I wouldn't buy that H-E-B though. That well, <laughs> you probably would. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's called cat facing. It's a physiological problem caused primarily by um, cold when the blossoms are forming. Oh. So that person probably planted their tomato too early. And this is, this is that. So the idea is you need to have an idea about what's normal and what's causing problems, if there is a problem, and if there truly is a pest, what pest? You don't just start shooting off flamethrowers. So how do you identify insects? This is the book, The Common Insects of Texas, which is um, probably the best thing out there. It's a field guide for Texas insects with big, beautiful uh, color photos, <coughs> a little bit of information about the different types, and you'll be able to find practically anything that would be in your yard in that book. Um, another thing these days that you can use is an app. This particular one is the one I use. I have it on my phone, and it's uh, Seek by iNaturalist, and you just take a photo of whatever it is, plant or insect or whatever, and um, use the app to identify it. And you don't necessarily need to know exactly what species it is, you know, maybe you'll get into the right ballpark and it'll tell you it's a wood boring beetle or it's scale or whatever. And then you'll know what to do. Um, this bug guide is one you can use on the computer. You can click on um, the basic shapes and it will help you narrow it down. So there's a lot of different ways that you can identify the insects. Uh, I have to stop uh, app for your phone. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Now, after you figure out what's normal, maybe you really do have a problem, then you need to do some scouting. You can monitor and assess the pest numbers and damage. Maybe it's not that bad. Maybe you're seeing a couple of bugs, but no big deal. You can live with it. Um, is that the only kind of plant that's being affected or do you find this bug on other plants? Is it just part of the plant? Maybe, uh, for example, like budworms eat flowers and nothing else. Um, you see patterns in the landscape. Maybe you're only finding this pest in shady areas, for example. Um, so it kind of gives you an idea of where the problem is, where is the pest located. Then you need to determine if you're going to do anything about it. What's your action threshold? You know, is that one aphid so offensive that you have to bring out the flamethrower, or can you live with it? Um, so you consider economic factors. Um, obviously, if they're eating all your tomatoes, then you have a problem. Um, if it's something maybe like a household pest, you don't want roaches trekking through your house. They can contaminate your food. Some people are allergic and have asthma and so on. Um, maybe it's an aesthetic problem, like they're eating the flowers. So you kind of have to weigh this, and of course I think it's an individual decision about how bothered are you by the pest. Now you're ready to intervene. You've decided it's way too many. I've got to do something about this. Um, the neat thing about IPM is that you've got a whole toolbox full of different options. You can have biological methods, cultural methods, physical and mechanical methods, even chemical management uh, possible. IPM stands for? Integrated Pest Management. 
So let's start with cultural control, because that's usually um, the best approach. First of all, you have to figure out, is, is the plant in the right place? Because oftentimes, we'll put a plant in a spot where it's not happy, it's stressed. It's getting too much water, not enough water, too much light, not enough light, maybe too many nutrients, or maybe not enough. Uh, maybe there's poor air circulation. So you need to consider all of those things. Um, you can also try to choose um, plants that are, first of all, not harboring any pests. So when you go to the nursery to buy plants, you really want to inspect them, you know, look at the underside of the leaf, look in the soil. I reject many plants that have holes because I assume they have flea beetles or something. So you don't want to bring that home. You can also look for resistant varieties because some are much better than others at resisting pests. And the other thing is, if you do notice pests, you want to throw away the refuse. You don't want to add it to your compost pile because then you're just compounding the problem. Um, a happy plant is probably going to be in good soil. It's going to have good drainage. It's going to have uh, the right amount of water. It's going to have the right amount of nutrients. And people often think that more fertilizer is better, but all you're doing is creating a whole bunch of new succulent growth that the pests love. So don't over fertilize because you're going to tend to attract more. Um, rotate crops. Um, for example, if you find that you have um, the um, squash bugs in your plants, the vine borers, they go down in the soil, um, the larvae are gonna be in the soil, and then you plant your squash the next year, and they come right back out and infest your new plants. So you wanna make sure you're rotating your squash each year. You wanna have diversity so that um, you're not creating this monoculture of, you know, let's say tomatoes over your entire yard because then the tomato pests will get to really high numbers. But if you have your squash and tomatoes and cucumbers and everything else, then you're going to have that diversity and the populations probably won't get too huge. Um, speaking of the squash vine borer, you can adjust your planting times because they tend to um, be in smaller numbers <coughs> towards the end of summer into fall. So if you wait, to plant squash, you can often avoid um, having big problems. Uh, mulching, cutting weeds, which can provide harborage where the pests can hang out, and then also providing habitat for predators can help. Um, <coughs> those are all aspects of cultural control. Now, sometimes uh, we move up to physical or mechanical control, like um, water sprays, you see aphids, you can zap them with water. You, you don't want to use a pressure washer and destroy your plant, but you know, a stream of water knocks the aphids down and they're little and it takes them a very long time to crawl back up. Um, for snails and slugs, uh, tomato hornworms, lots of the bigger ones that you can get your hands on, you can just pick and squish. Uh, here in the bottom, Photo, you can see row covers. That's what I always resort to to keep the um, the cabbage, uh, the little white moths off of my cabbage and, and other brassicas. There's just no other way. Is the diffusion of light does that help some of the plants too? Mm, it could if it's really intense, but they're really here for uh, keeping out um, things like. Um, moths and, and things like that. The squash vine borer actually turns into a moth. Hmm. It's the larvae that are eating the stems of your squash. So you can um, keep out the adults and avoid the squash vine borer. That's interesting. You can use nets, um, traps like um, sticky, fly paper, Barriers um, or mowing and tillage all can, can help. Uh, like for the squash vine borer, if you rototill through the soil before you plant, it cuts up the larvae.
And then we've already talked a little bit about biological control. Um, PPP, predators, parasitoids, pathogens, like our friend, the laconid wasp that lays its eggs on the caterpillar, or you can see a ladybug eating aphids down there at the bottom. Now, if you immediately reach for the pesticide, what's gonna to happen to your, your PPP? You're gonna kill, to make kill the good, to make yeah, kill gonna, good guys. You're gonna get all the helpful ones. Um, another aspect of biological control is genetic resistance. So if you find plants that are just genetically stronger, then they may be um, able to avoid um, the, um, the pests. That's a happy ladybug. Yeah. And then finally, chemical control is certainly part of IPM, but as a last resort. You've gone through cultural, you've tried physical or mechanical, you've tried biological, nothing's working. So, okay, now I'm ready to use some chemical control. But I'm going to start with the organics, like pyrethrum, which is from chrysanthemums. Neem oil comes from the neem tree. Other essential oils, uh, pine, citrus, clove, or insecticidal soaps. These are, are not as toxic as some of the synthetic pesticides, but they will still kill both the good and the bad bugs. So you have to be careful about using these because you could wipe out your helpful predators or the bees and the other pollinators. I heard that when I, I use neem oil sometimes, and I was told not to put the neem oil in midday, but put it on towards the evening so it doesn't burn. I guess it's right. flammable for the Well, if, you, if it's over 85 degrees, you don't want to use neem oil because basically you're frying your plants. Right. Okay. So, um, but it can be very effective for some kinds of insect pests because it basically suffocates them. You're just covering them in oil. Who watches this crazy show about these two? What's the name of it? Um, I don't know. They, um, um, the, the guy to go get bugs and all that stuff out of the house. Oh, yeah. Exterminate. <laughs> yes. Okay. And they always, when they have to go get bees, that's what, because they don't use anything that would harm. And they use that, the first one, are you saying? Hey, right, right. Right. Yeah, they always talk about that, and they spray it in there, and then the bees just fly away. Now, I don't know if they die or not, but they get out of there. Um, <coughs> well, many plants make their own insecticides, like tobacco. Uh -huh. It's full of nicotine, which is incredibly toxic. Uh -huh. That's why it has nicotine. It's keeping out insects. Uh -huh. But they talk about it like they make some chrysanthemums yeah. and all it's, that. It's still going to kill the good, good it bugs. It does kill the bees. Yeah, it, well. it could. Um, so if, if you do go for a synthetic pesticide, the, the main thing I want to emphasize is always read labels for any chemical you're using, whether it's you know insecticidal soap or whether it's some synthetic pesticide. Read and follow directions. Um, so if you're choosing a pesticide, you want to make sure it is selective. That means that it's going to target that pest. A lot of pesticides on their um, packaging say broad spectrum, you know, and they have like 10,000 different things that it kills. Well, that's not what you want. You want something that's very narrow and selective. Um, another thing to consider is persistence because there's some pesticides that will stay in the environment and remain toxic for years, like DDT. They pass through the food chain. They kill all sorts of other things. And then also, of course, um, you want to be cognizant of time rate and place where spray. So if you're trying to avoid the pollinators, like the bees, you might spray in the evening after the bees have gone to bed. And that would tend to minimize the effects on them. So you can see this is very typical of um, what you'll see for IPM. It's called the pyramid of IPM methods, starting with the prevention or cultural methods, then moving up to physical or mechanical methods, then maybe biological, then maybe if we're still having a problem, soaps and mechanicals, and then at the top would be the synthetics. Um, and what's happening is you're increasing in toxicity as you go up the pyramid. So, you know, if you can always start with the, the more 
uh, benign, less toxic methods, and then escalate if you have to, but you probably solved your problem. And then it's a good idea to um, <coughs> keep records and then review your work. So um, you, you kind of want to evaluate, did it work? Um, was the method itself satisfactory? Uh, were there any side effects that I noticed that I killed a bunch of bees, maybe? Um, and what are you going to do in the future if you have the same pest situation? So by doing this, you can kind of be prepared because maybe you notice that, okay, I noticed um, the leaf-footed bug on my tomatoes on the 1st of June. Well, next year you can be on the lookout. Maybe nip them in the bud before they get too advanced. So I'm going to give you one example of using IPM, and um, it's for sap sucking insects. Let's say I go out and I see aphids on my roses. Okay, so what is normal? Well, aphids on roses are pretty normal, and probably I'm going to notice them um, when the flower buds are developing in spring, because that's nice, succulent, tasty new growth. Okay, well, is it really that bad? All right, I'm seeing aphids all over the top of my rose. Not too happy about that. Uh, so then threshold levels, you know, is it is it going to destroy my roses? Uh, will I still get uh, flowers? You kind of look at all of those factors. All right, and then I would intervene. Let's say I'm, I'm so offended by these aphids, I decide, yes, I need to do something about them. So, does anybody remember what my first step would be? Water. Water. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wash them. Yep. Um, if you see other problems, um, well, possibly you could cut out the infested stems and leaves, but in this case, I'm probably be removing all my flowers. So, <laughs> um, so then we might go up to water streams, like we mentioned. Um, protective covers are another really good way of excluding. Um, some pests. You kind of have to know your pest. Um, so I wouldn't use row covers for aphids, uh, but I might use them, as I mentioned, for cabbages. But in this case, probably the water stream is going to be enough. Then I probably wouldn't take any other action because I want to give the predators a chance. And what you'll notice is that you'll find the pest population increases and then there's a lag because it takes time for the predators to find them and build up their numbers. So then the predator population increases. If I'm busy spreading chemicals all over the place, I'm probably gonna kill the predators. But if I'm patient, then maybe the parasitic wasps or lady beetles or lace wings or other good predators for aphids um, may come in and, and deal with the problem for me. And then if I'm still seeing tons of aphids and I'm just so upset about it, then maybe I might use uh, some neem oil, some insecticide. What's the also. time frame? Um, you know? To tell the truth, I would do nothing. If I see aphids on my roses, I don't care. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and I still have roses. 